Well, what a morning I've just had. I'm down here at Carthagena Fisheries, Jerry Hammond's place in the Lee Valley. Real old historic Lee Valley water, a complex of lakes. I'm gonna be here to fish Brook Lake, um, but I've got a mate next door fishing Carthagena Syndicate water, and he has just had one hell of a trip. So last night he had three 30 pounders, uh, and this morning he messaged a friend of mine to say that he'd seen a huge common show over his spot. Well, we were stood here chewing the fat this morning, having a cup of tea, and the phone pinged, and he'd got an enormous common in the net, as wide as a double-decker bus, so he said. He was absolutely buzzing for it. What an incredible start to this trip. To be able to witness that fish, a personal best for Chris, 50 pound, eight ounce English common, um, you know, such a special moment. And um, yeah, what a way to start the day. And, and the clouds parted, the sun came out, illuminated that carp as he was returning it. And uh, yeah, that, that, that moment will stay with me and I'm sure it'll stay with Chris for the rest of his life as one of the, the real key moments in his angling. Great way to start, what a brilliant way to, to uh, open up my session coming down into this, this beautiful looking complex. Brook Lake on the Carthagena Syndicate. I've been given special permission to come down here by Jerry Hammond. I feel very fortunate. It's a beautiful, beautiful, intimate, mature Lee Valley gravel pit. It's small, I reckon five, six acres, and it's sort of split into two. You've got a big reed bed that divides the lake almost in half. Big chunk of open water with a few little intimate bays, and then a much shallower reed line section behind that with some swims set into the corners. It really, really does look like one of those waters that you can have a good walk round, find fish in, snags and little tucked away areas so it's an exciting place to come. Right, so I've had a good look round the lake. I've had a couple of laps, both sides. I've decided on this swim purely because this morning I saw three carp show, slightly to the right of the swim, but pretty much in front of this one. I've also seen a few signs next door and I've decided to put a little bit of bait out there just to give me something to look at for the night. But in the interim time, I'm gonna have a little lead around out here, find out what's in front of me and go from there. That's why the fish get in that. Loads of naturals in there. Pea mussels, zebras, bloodworm. Be little shrimps in there as well. Still quite fresh actually. Look, there's a shrimp there. There is nothing quite like being bankside in the autumn really. As we approach 
the equinox. I think there's an undeniable expectation in the carp fishing scene, I suppose. You get longer, cooler nights. There's that, I don't know, there's that smell of decay in the air, you know? As you sort of approach mid-September, everything starts dying back. All the berries are out on the bushes. The blackberries are all dying off, especially if you get some heavy rain like you do at this time of year. Big low pressures sweeping off the Atlantic. Yeah, the weather just it improves everything that we want in carp fishing. You know, those big low pressures, rain, damp, cool mornings, mist, the odd sunny afternoon. It's all there, you know. It's a really exciting time of year to be on the bank. And the best bit of it really is that the carp are in peak condition. You know, spawning is way, way behind us now. Uh, the carp have been eating, they've rejuvenated the, all those abrasions and sores that they got during that spawning activity. They're all healed, they're plump, they're at their best weights generally. And colours, you know, as the water cools, you generally tend to find that colours come out in those carp and they look absolutely splendid. Um, so yeah, I really always look forward to autumn. It's one of my favourite times of year to be on the bank. Not just for the atmosphere, but for all those other reasons that I just spoke about. I'm settled in the swim now, got a beautiful swim, fishing out into the open water. I've got a lot of weed out to my left, but I've got a beautiful spot. And it's the swim where I saw those fish earlier that I've settled into finally. And yeah, we've got a, a long night ahead of us. I'm looking forward to hearing a few fish show after dark. There's some cracking looking fish in here, some beautiful scaly mirrors, and there's a really big common, a special old common goes by the name of Bullnose. Um, it's, it's a big fish, possibly touching on 50 pound. So, you know, that sort of gives you the real excitement when you're casting rods into a lake like this. It's got atmosphere, it's got everything I like, it's quiet. I'm on the back of the wind, so, you know, the wind's gonna die off tonight. I know it's gonna go flat calm. I'm gonna be sitting up till late in the early hours. I'm gonna be listening out for those carp. I wanna pinpoint down exactly where they're showing and where they're moving. I'm really looking forward to the night ahead. It's got everything that I really, really love about a lake. So let's see what the night brings. It's an autumnal night, cloud cover, feels mild. It's looking really good. Let's see what happens. First morning, I've seen a lot of activity. There's a lot of activity during the night. Uh, I was woken up a number of times, not just by the mosquitoes and rats, but by the carp lumping out. And they're well spread out right around this area of the pit. I've had fish to the left, fish to the right in this little bay. I've seen a couple in open water a bit later on this morning. Um, One's just shown quite near my baited area, but the shows are random, they're, they're all over the place, and I haven't actually seen anything that suggests that they're feeding in any one particular area, or even feeding at all. They're, they're quite sort of playful, if you like. Um, it's in one show, and he's definitely gone down and had a bit of a flank on the bottom, and there's this area of dead pads to my right, and uh, there's been one or two show in there, and they've gone down and sort of flanked off the old roots, um, I leaded that area up yesterday and um, yeah, it's, it's quite a jungle down there. We just have to assess later today exactly what's going on. I've got a, I've got a little bit of a plan. Uh, I heard one round on uh, an area that I put a little bit of bait yesterday afternoon. Uh, it sounded like a really good fish. 
I think if nothing happens here during bite time this morning, I'm quite possibly going to move into that swim for the night, uh, put a rod on that little close-in area that I heard that fish show, and um, yeah, hopefully that's a night bite on the cards. So it's one of them mornings, just got to assess what's happening. The weather's changeable. Uh, we've got a bit of rain coming in, um, broken cloud. So, you know, conditions look favorable. We've just got to find some feeding carp. Uh, that's the main sort of crux of what we're gonna to do today. You've got to find some feeding carp, make a decision on what to do tonight. So the sun's come out, I've reeled in, and I've come for a little look around the complex. I hope you can hear me, because we're sat right on the banks of the River Lee. We're here at Carthagena Lock. And you can probably hear the weir pool churning away behind me there. I'm actually sat on the steps of the, the Syndicate Lodge here. So, you know, it's just a, a lovely part of these old syndicates, these, these sort of, you know, really friendly syndicates that are full of camaraderie and it gives you a nice place to come and have a few beers with your mates in the evening or a hot curry or whatever and just a, a little bit of chill out time away from the lake and uh, you know I love this sort of thing it adds it adds something to the the essence of the place you know um, you know I'd imagine a lot of well-known anglers have trod this path and stepped up this little veranda into that into that old clubhouse there and gone and got their bait out of the freezer or had a beer in, on a hot sunny afternoon and I've just had a little scout around in there actually. I found a couple of old photograph albums and there's these pictures of these beautiful old scaly mirrors and ancient old commons. I think these fish are really old, you know, the history of this place. I don't know a huge amount about it, but what I have found out is that, you know, the commons are really, really old. I don't think Jerry, who runs the syndicate, has put any commons in here since he's been here. So these are old carp. And the mirrors, just the same, you know, there's a, a a big old stock of lovely carp. And he's put some, you know, he's, he's added to the stock, carefully hand-picked mirrors. I've seen some of those pictures and they look absolutely stunning. You know, these sort of things are exactly what you come to expect from a really, really good complex. And I've just had a walk around Carthagena itself, the lake next door to Brook where I'm fishing. Again, a lovely old historic pit in the Lee Valley here. One of the standout things for it is that as you approach the lake, there's this enormous gunnera plant, you know, great big sort of leaves on it, eight foot wide. It's incredible. It just adds something special to the place as well, you know. Yeah, I've had a really good break from the swim, time to clear my head. Yeah, and I've made a bit of a plan. I'm actually going to move swim again. I'm going to, I'm going to move further up the lake. Um, despite what I saw this morning, those fish have just melted away. Uh, I haven't seen anything since sort of breakfast time so I'm going to put a new plan into action move to a different part of the lake where I did hear a few carp last night and uh, we're going to go back and uh, get the rods out and plot it up in that new swim so we'll go from there. Right, so after this morning, watching those fish showing, I pinpointed where the, the shows were, obviously, triangulated them and what have you, and just used the leading rod to, to look at those sort of spots. And what's transpired is that they've been showing over the real heavy debris. So a couple of the areas have been like real heavy pad roots, loads of old cabbage that's left there, and... Uh, the other spots have been over like foot high silkweed, real heavy, thick silkweed, ever so difficult to present in and what have you, but it's full of food. You know, there's a lot of food in there. So I'm, I've moved into this new swim and uh, I've already got a couple of spots marked. I'm just looking for a, a third area here. Um, and I'm just looking for that softer, that softer drop. 
in amongst where the natural food's liable to be at this time of year. Just letting the carp tell me where they want to be, you know, and, and, and all the signs are that they're feeding in the, the detritus, you know, the dirtier areas, areas that we might, you know, potentially overlook quite often. Um, but at this time of year, they can be the most prolific spots. You know, the real clean, polished areas are done. Uh, there's not a lot of food left on them. Um, they've been caught off them a, a number of times. So you're looking for that, you know, that, those areas, the untouched areas really, the, the, the harvestable areas for this time of year. And these fish are almost telling me that that's where they want to eat. Um, the, you know, the, the harder drops that I was looking for when I first dropped onto the lake yesterday, they haven't produced this morning. And uh, although I'm going to keep one rod on a, a firmer area that seems to be you know, quite close to a number of shows. The rest of it, I'm looking for the dirtier drops. I think that's where I'm gonna get my bite, but we'll see. Just gonna get this one out there. Found a little pocket of silt in amongst the siltweed. And it sort of seems, it's a soft drop, but I'm getting a clean pull up. And I'll show you, look, there's no siltweed on the lead. It's clean, but it's, it's slidey, it's in the silt. It's a soft drop. So I'll just put this lead out to the left. And there's almost no drop. And I'm pulling into the silkweed. And if, if I pull the lead, it's locking up. Lots of And it's pulled out the silkweed, but you're getting strands. It's not very heavy, not like the further down the lake you go. It seems to be a lot, lot heavier. But I've pulled in a fair amount of it and it's absolutely crawling with snails, shrimps, little bloodworm. I mean, it, there's a lot of life in there. And obviously at this time of year, that's what the carp are looking for. You know, I've got a fair, fair raft of it here. Some old snail shells, look. You can see all the snails in there, look. They're all buried, all hiding in that, in that matted weed. Look, shells, little zebra mussels, look. Are they zebra, little pea mussels? A few shrimps. There's a lot of shell in here though. Look, there's a lot of shell, a few little bloodworm. There's a lot of shell, quite possibly they've been feeding on them snails. And they're crapping the shells out over the top of the silkweed. There's quite a lot of it there, look, 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 can you see it all? Look, all the snail shell, look. It's all been crapped out onto the weed. There's a good chance that they've been feeding in that zone sometime, you know, in the last few days. <laughs> So what started off as quite a quiet morning, cold, clear, clear skies, 
suddenly got quite a bit more interesting. So the little rod I've got off the side of this bar here, suddenly see a big plume of bubbles come up off there. It's faded away, another little set of bubbles. Really, really, it's right over the top of the rod. Anyway, I'm sitting here watching and suddenly the, the left hand rod signalled a bit of a take. Bobbin's pulled up tight. I've watched the line starting to slice out to the left. Pick the rod up, it's clearly not a bite. It's clearly the fish has moved off of the spot. It's come on the inside margin, just picked the line up on the left hand rod. So anyway, I've skipped that rod in. I've got it out of the way now. I'm not gonna put that back out. Don't want any disturbance in the area. These are ultra, ultra cute fish. They're, they're really, really spooky. I'm not gonna put that lead back out there. I'm gonna wait and see. There's, I saw a fish maybe an hour before first light show about a rod length past that rod so they're interested in the area let's just see if we can't get a bite this morning off that I'm going to leave it really quiet I'm just going to sit back keep the swim as quiet as possible and see if they can't get in and have a little bit of a feed on those uh, those little bits of free offering that I put out there last night so we've got a chance let's hope a little while finally we've had a bite lovely dark old brook lake common come off the long rod and I baited yesterday afternoon with the boilies lovely fight in this deep margin he's not ready That was a hard-earned October carp, but that looks like that's ended the session in a grand way. So I'm well chuffed with this one. Worked hard for you, mate. There we go. Gorgeous dark old Brook Lake common. October, traditional methods, hinges over a spread of boilies in the silt, came good in the end. We came here for, a, for his big brother really, a really big old common that has a, a habit of coming out at this time of year, but he didn't turn up. But the journey continues. We've got adventures elsewhere starting next week. I'm looking forward to that, but for now, I'm going to get this old boy back home. Glad to make your acquaintance, mate. You're very, very welcome. On a gorgeous, sunny October morning. Lovely. Winter 2020 was a bit of a non-starter to be perfectly honest. 
Uh, as we all know, the global pandemic really shut us all down. My own county was put into tier four pretty early, uh, stopped the traveling. All my plans for winter fishing came to a, a grinding halt. And, and I love my winter fishing. And most of the time, my campaigns will travel from autumn through winter and into the following spring. Obviously last year, that all, that all fell by the wayside. Uh, it's a bit of a shame, but that's life. And uh, you know, with these big carp scenarios and fishing in general, you know, you've got to take the rough with the smooth, the ups and the downs. It's a roller coaster ride, really. And um, you know, you have to be as fluid as the as the lakes that we're fishing and, and and roll with the punches. So, you know, I took that one on the chin as we all had to. Winter passed by, and obviously we had that long wait before we could get back out uh, for those glorious months of spring. Um, spring's a great time of the year. We all want to be out there. And, um, you know, I was fortunate. I had a, an ongoing campaign from the, the previous year that I could sort of pick up and run with. Um, mega, mega low stock venue. And with those type of scenarios, you know, there's, there's times when you know that you need to be there at the, at the lake. And there, there's other times when your time's better spent elsewhere. And this is just one of those periods. And I've got this ticket, a beautiful, beautiful old estate lake uh, in Royal Berkshire, sort of sandwiched between the River Kennet and the Kennet and Avon Canal. And I just thought it's the perfect time to, to get back up here. And of course, I've heard on the grapevine that it, it's done a few of the, the really big fish in recent weeks, um, which is great. You know, it's, it's a low stock venue. Not many uh, carp to go at, but the ones that have been caught so far have been, uh, been the, the real monsters. So I thought I'd drop back up here and um, yeah, here we are in May. Lovely time of the year to be on the bank and uh, we're doing our best to find some carp. Well, if things aren't hard enough on a low stock pit, you get a situation like this. You got uh, two cut throughs either side of the causeway. And uh, this channel's well deep enough for those fish to pass from one lake to the other. So there's no telling with exactly what we're fishing for in there. They could be all next door in Cranwell's. You just never know, and it's happened in the past. You know, they, they can move from one side to the other. The old parrot that used to live in there, the British record, that actually got into Oxleys at some point and it was seen in there, although it was never caught. Um, but it did travel into here and, and likewise, the fish that are generally resident in here can pass through and uh, come and see their brothers next door, especially around spawning time, you know? The pheromones and what have you are passing through and that little trickle of water is a, is a real drag for these fish. They always want to get to where they can't be sort of thing. And, um, with the winter floods, there's still a lot of water under the bridge here, so makes life interesting, eh? <laughs> Oxley's Lake, it's a gravel pit of around nine acres, sandwiched between the Kennet and Avon Canal and the, the River Kennet also been known as the deep pit and it is incredibly deep. Basically you've got a shelf that runs around the perimeter of the pit, really shallow, sort of two or three foot, sh gently shelving away into 13s, 14s and then it just drops away into the abyss. Uh, through the centre of the lake you've got depths down to I, I think 42 feet in places when the water level's up. Certainly loads of 30 foot, quite a lot of 20 foot. Topography is a big marked factor in, in fishing this, this pit. It's a low stock venue, not really entirely sure on exactly how many carp, but it's no more than probably 30, probably between 20 and 30 carp, we think. But there is a, a handful of real big ones. Yeah, a few big mirrors and, uh, you know, the biggest fish um, a common of over 55 pounds, a real monster.
Right, so we've done nearly a full lap of the lake now. Um, haven't seen any carp, checked out a lot of the most likely looking sort of spots, all around the snags, in the corners, on the ledges and whatnot. Um, yeah, no signs really. We've come round to the, the sort of the, the pinch point, the narrowest section of the lake before it opens out into a, a bowl-like area, um, which is where 99% of the bites have come from this spring. Um, but it's obviously busy. Uh, in fact, I don't think it's been free for the last six to eight weeks. So um, again, there's no chance of getting in there uh, and we can't really look at that area because it's controlled by one swim. So this is the entrance to that area um, before it opens out into the main section of the lake on, on our left here. Um, we're positioned at the top, the top end of the lake in a swim called the woods. The lake shallows up there quite a bit and it starts to get a fair bit of weed up there. So um, we're expecting the fish to start visiting that area fairly soon. Um, the grebes are working the area, the cormorant, there's a lot of small fish up there. Um, they're getting over the top of that weed. There's eel grass coming up and being ripped up. Um, a lot of tench up there, but so far um, I've only seen one sign and um, it's a case of the fish are locked down in one area. They're using a big set of snags like they sometimes do in the spring. This spring's been particularly cold, uh, quite wet just recently. Um, the weed hasn't really got going. We, we haven't had temperatures above 14 degrees really for any length of time. So we're well behind, we're a good month behind. And being a deep lake, this is generally a bit behind a lot of the other waters anyway. Plus it got badly flooded in the winter. So as you can see, the fish have, have sort of remained locked down in their, their little zone. They don't really want to come out even under intense pressure that, um, you know, I've, since being up here, I found out that they've been under a lot of pressure in this area, but there they remain. So that's carp fishing for you. We'll, uh, we'll carry on looking and look for any other opportunities we can find. We've reached the end of the first full day. It's now late evening. We've had a good look round the lake today. And despite my best efforts looking in all the nooks and crannies and corners and what have you, haven't seen any fish. So sort of made the plan up a little bit earlier in the day. If I couldn't find anything, I'd probably drop back into this, into this swim, just put my rods back out onto the little bit of bait that I put out and, you know, look to get up really early tomorrow morning, first light, probably stay up late tonight as well as it happens, um, see if they're showing in the dark or whatever. There's a good chance they could be creeping up here in the dark hours, but I've got a creep, I've got that sort of feeling that, that they're locked down in them sort of snaggy uh, end, the other end of the lake. And there's nothing I can do about that because uh, that, that's occupied. You know, you, ha you have to make the best of, uh, of the job that you've got in front of you. And uh, this, this bay up here has got low weed. I've got three nice spots, fairly shallow ground for this lake. It's a very deep pit. And I'm, you know, I found three spots that are in sort of 12, 13 foot, which is a good depth. Haven't seen anything to, to, to make me really want to move. But as you can see, we've got all the, we're surrounded by all the luxuries, which is, is really unusual. This lake has, you know, it's got a track running right the way around it. It's fully auto fenced. I can park the van at the back of the swim. All, all the swims have got uh, vehicle access. Over the last couple of decades, I've fished some, you know, pretty rough and ready old pits, some big wild venues and what have you. Long barrow pushes, minimum kit, you know, really sort of sacrificing quite a lot to get access to the fish and the swims and what have you. Uh, so this venue to me, it's um, 
it, yeah, there's a little bit of a joke among some of my friends. I've called it the retirement pit because uh, you know you can bring everything with you. You don't have to barrow. I've got the barbecue. I've got some beers. Got some lovely food to, to cook up. Um, access to all my kit at the back of the van. It really is, uh, you know, it, it's something very different for me, but something that I'm, I'm going to relish for a, for a little while once I get going on this place, you know. And, uh, and my plan is to fish this uh, this venue for for the coming year and uh, and next year, however long it takes to. I'm going to enjoy it. You know, this is going to be a really, really enjoyable venue. Um, I've waited long enough for the ticket. Had my name down on the waiting list, you know, where, when the parrot was still alive in the in the lake next door. And um, in that time, I've kept my name on the, on the list. And and this particular lake has, has flourished in that time. You know, uh, it, the big fish have grown on, and you know, there's some some real viable, good-looking carp in here, and three definite real big ones to go at. So there's a great future ahead for this this lake and my time on here I'm looking forward to it and it's going to be a completely is a sort of almost like a radical change from the sort of fishing that I've been used to in recent times so yeah let's see what the night ahead brings and um, yeah hopefully in the morning we might see a few fish to go on and we can make the most of this lovely time of year end of May weather's been a bit changeable but it's looking good So it was a really quiet night last night, as is to be expected at this time of year, spring, it's normally about the daylight hours. But yeah, stayed up till around one, um, been up since quarter to four this morning. There's a bit of a cool westerly wind blowing now. The tench got active, sort of first light through till, yeah, for about two hours. I have seen one small carp clatter out over the far margins. One small carp, even on a low stock pit, isn't really enough to to keep me interested in this area for another night. So I think I'm gonna have a little bit of breakfast, wrap the kit up, um, get on the move, go and have another look round. I've got that feeling that those fish are still locked down at the other end. I mean, there's nothing I can do about that. There's anglers in that area. So I'm gonna go and have a look what, what opportunities might present themselves this morning, see if there's anything showing that I can move on to. If not, I'll get myself in a position as close to those fish now as I can for the last night and see if that makes any difference. Um, you know, that's big carp fishing. You just got to get on the move, go looking for them and make the best of any opportunities that present themselves. So that's what we're going to do today. That's the plan. Right, so we've packed and come down the other end of the lake. Uh, lack of activity last night, no real solid shows this morning apart from that one real small carp. Um, I've decided to move on the strength of a, a fresh west-southwest wind that's now licking into the margins of this narrow section of the lake that, that sort of filters round into the, the area where the fish have been getting caught by all accounts over the last couple of months. I've got a nice little passing point over the other side of the lake there, like a little peninsula that sticks out, it's reed lined, there's some snaggy 
twiggy trees that sort of hang in the water there, give the fish a bit of cover. You know, I'm sure that they creep round in and out of this, this section to my right here. It's, it's as near as I can get to where the fish have been coming from. The swim's available, the sun's coming out, so it's just kissing these reed beds on the far margins now, which makes it look that much more appealing than, than yesterday when the, the southwesterly was battering into them uh, and it was really quite cold. So, you know, there's a good chance uh, that fish might creep in and out during the dark hours. And uh, as I say, we've got one night left. This is a, as good a punt as any. I haven't actually seen one here yet. I'm gonna have a quick lead around, find the spots, clip the rods up, uh, and I'll decide whether I'm gonna actually uh, walk around and throw a bit of bait in. I might even fish single tonight. I haven't decided yet. I'll make my mind up once I've leaded these spots and found where I really wanna fish. So I'm gonna get on with that now. So I've got down into the new swim, spent a little while having a good lead around. I feel that compared to the, the swim previous of last night, which was more of a, a holding area or potentially with the weed and the nature of the swim, this is more of a passing point. The contours of this lake, I'll explain a little bit about it. It's, a, it's an incredibly deep lake in a lot of places and you've got a major, major sort of central trough of deep water. And that's, that's very apparent in this particular swim. You've got a very short marginal ledge, almost like a little track that runs round right under your feet, drops away into the abyss, 25 to 30 odd feet out in the middle, and then it gradually slopes up and there's another, almost like a sort of um, a marginal ledge that sort of extends out from the reed beds and you've got this little peninsula that pokes out, uh, creating this channel and passing point almost. So. I'm going to change my tactics a little bit. Um, I've leaded up two spots, got two firm drops over there. There's a little bit of weed, a little bit of silt, but I've got two firm drops around the peninsula. Um, before I put the rigs out, I'm going to walk around there and I'm going to take some crumb. I'm going to crumb some boilies up. I'm just going to scatter it around the point. As I say, I'm not trying to create a major feed in here. I don't want to, I'm not trying to stop fish moving. I don't think you can, but you can create a little area of interest I'm gonna fish two low line pop-ups in that situation. I wanna sort of attract their attention and get a quick bite before they move in or if they're moving out to open water. Uh, that's the sort of theory behind that, not going heavy with the bait, it's just a light sprinkle. To create a third option, I've had a little lead around in, in open water, found the, the shelf as it comes up onto a, almost like a, a plateau running around the corner of this point that I'm on. Um, found nine foot, clean gravel, eel grass around it. That's perfect for a little bit more bait. Any fish that's sort of gonna browse around on that plateaui area in amongst the weed, I wanna actually draw them down and keep them in that area. So I've got some lovely 16 mil krill that have been soaking in some liquid for two or three days. I give it a few pouchfuls out there. I've got the float out there. Um, I found exactly which side I wanna drop the rig, the best bit. Again, I'm going to probably put a, a low line pop up on that, match the hatch sort of thing. And um, that's all three rods sorted. That's my work done for the day. Um, and we're just going to go into the, uh, the evening now with the rods out, spots sorted, sit down, chill out, look for some carp, hopefully see something this evening. The sun's out. It's, um, it's really a, a marked contrast from, from yesterday and this morning when it was, it was quite chilly. It's warmed up. Life feels good, lovely times.
back in Berkshire, it just feels like home from home really, you know. It's been a long while since I've been up this way, but uh, I spent a good number of years in this area. I don't know, six, seven years chasing some of the, you know, the real big prestigious fish in the area. Started off with the Burfield Common, moved over onto Englefield Lagoon, Pingewood, the Brute, down the road to Dinton with the Twin and Paw Print and what have you, you know, and all the while accompanied by my old mate Jim, my, my faithful old fishing companion, which is, uh, you know, absolutely great. And he spent all those, all those years traveling up the motorway to this, uh, to this zone. And, uh, you know, here we are back again. Uh, Jim's still with me, He's gonna be 14 this year. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's great to still have him with me. He's, you know, he's been the best thing on these, these trips and I know, you know, things wouldn't be quite the same without him, you know. He's, he's not quite as well as he used to be and those, those big, hard, wild pits, uh, you know, we just wouldn't be able to do that. So it's like this place is absolutely perfect, this ways in it. It was like one of those tickets that it, it, was, meant, it was meant to be almost, you know, for me and for him, it meant that he could still accompany me on these, these little adventures out of Kent. And um, he's only got one lung now, bless his heart, you know, and uh, he certainly wouldn't be doing the bike rides and the, the long walks around Burfields and, and Englefields. Those big pit adventures were harsh. They were physically demanding for both me and Jim. You know, miles and miles of legwork, looking through rough terrain, overgrown paths. Burfield and Englefield were, were you know, both savage. We, you know, we put a lot of heart, heart and soul into it. And, you know, I definitely know that, you know, those days are done for the old boy. And this, this ticket just fell into my lap as if by fate, you know, a, a stroke of luck. And it's, uh, it's definitely perfect for both of us really now. So. Uh, yeah, ideal, eh, Jim? It's a glorious spring evening. Stood out here in the waders, gives me a good panoramic view up and down the lake, having a good look. Rods went out as sweet as they possibly could have done. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to kick back, enjoy the evening, hopefully see a carp, or uh, even better than that, we'll get one in the net, but we shall see. Big carp fishing is a never-ending adventure, a true roller coaster of a, a ride, the ups and downs, the highs and lows. It's a, a roller coaster of emotions, um, and those emotions can lead you in all sorts of directions. It can take you, uh, you know, to the absolute limits of your, of your endurance, you know, mentally and physically. It's a real state of mind. Big carp fishing always has been all about that ability to push yourself to the absolute limits to really finally achieve what you truly desire. It's never going to be easy. There's always going to be parts of it that will, will test every part of your resolve. Unless you're prepared to, to go through those, those points of pain almost, um, you know, you're never going to fully take yourself into that limitless opportunity. You know, the, the, the opportunities only arise when you're prepared to motivate yourself to the lengths of driving out uh, in all weathers, in all seasons, and for almost unlimited amounts of time. You know, you never know whether it's gonna take you weeks, months, or a number of years. 
So that fish that you've chosen, that adversary, has got to have all those attributes that is going to keep you at that lake and push you to those limits because you want that final moment. During that period of time, there will be a connection. There will be a hunter and hunted connection where you, you see that fish visually. You can then only speculate what that's going to be like. You know, you, you're, you're always thinking, you know, you know, the power of this fish, the size of that carp, you know, the anticipation of hooking that fish. And when you do, those, you know, those jelly leg moments as you're playing a, a huge fish, feeling that raw power, it's an incredible feeling that's so hard to recreate. You know, it's, it's only the most testing moments in life that you can attribute it to. That's what you're looking for, that massive rush of adrenaline. And when you finally put that fish in the net and you reach in and, and touch it, touch that fish, that big, powerful carp with, you know, age, history, uh, a story behind it, whatever, that's the moment, you know, you're lost in time that moment's only going to last a very short period of time, but the memory will last a lifetime, you know, and that's what we're all looking for. You know, that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Always, always looking, always searching, always waiting for that next, that next one in line, that next adventure that's going to take you who knows where. That's what it's all about. That's where, that's where big carp fishing has got everything going for it but you've got to be up to the challenge it's difficult it's hard it's challenging but ultimately it's incredibly rewarding So the last morning, a really quiet night. Uh, been up since quarter past four, um, seen absolutely nothing at all. It does seem that with these really deep lakes, and we've got depths down to, you know, 35 foot odd in here. Uh, it might only be nine acres, but that's a lot of volume of water to warm up. This spring, we haven't really had the sunshine or the nighttime temperatures to get that water, that, that water temperature up, to get the fish moving. After being here for, for two days now, it, it, it's plainly obvious those fish are, are pretty much locked down in a, in a little snag-lined margin. I can't get in the area. This is as close as I can get. That's just life on these, these sort of waters. You know, it is low stock. There's not a lot else to go on. When the fish are grouped up tight and they're not moving about, um, you know, sometimes it's just a case of having to wait your turn. You know, it's, it's a bit like going to Vegas. You've got to, you've got to accept the, the spin of that roulette wheel. And, um, you know, it, it's just like that sometimes. And, uh, you know, next trip, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm off doing other things now. I've still got another project going on. Um, I will be back up here as the water temperatures warm up. And, uh, you know, hopefully next trip, the fish will have spread out a little bit, the weed will be up, uh, and it would be a bit more of a level playing field. You know, there'd be more options to, to get on the carp. Um, so until that time, um, you know, I'm going to play it by ear. I've got a few, uh, a few other things to, to be doing, but um, I'm looking forward to my next trip uh, to this, this magical venue. You know, it really is a super cool place to be. I love it, little Jim loves it, and um, yeah, we'll be back soon. <laughs>